Within the bomb calorimeter, this is actually the part that's known as the bomb. What it consists of is a very thick walled stainless steel tube that has been formed into a container and proof tested to make sure that it can handle high, high pressures during the actual experiment where we burn or explode our material. Now, it's not really exploding, but what it's doing is it's burning and we have about 20 atmospheres of oxygen inside to guarantee that we have complete combustion of the product. So here we have the actual container and then next to it is the lid which screws on the top and what also goes inside which is of interest is the actual way in which we ignite our material. Now you'll notice that this is the lid that goes on the top. There's two electrodes on the top, the two holes, this one and this one, and those serve to allow us to pass an electrical current down through these insulated holes to this nichrome wire, which may or may not show up. You can kind of see the nichrome wire there. This is nothing more than toaster oven wire, but when you apply a current to it at zero with, with 20 atmospheres of oxygen, it's not going to survive. It's going to oxidize readily and it's going to ignite whatever fuel we've put inside. Now we carefully measure this wire because as the wire burns it is going to add heat energy to our system which we will then later subtract out. So before we do the experiment and after we do the experiment we measure the wire and measure the wire that's left so that we can know how much of our energy source is due to the wire itself. Here's our fuel. Now again the fuel can be anything we want to be. In the past we've looked at actual fuel like gasoline or diesel. We've looked at food, peanuts, uh, crickets. Um, it, most recently we actually looked at Pop-Tarts. Frosted Pop-Tarts versus unfrosted Pop-Tarts. And possibly this quarter, not sure what we'll do, but I'm looking at what I call rice husks or what I sometimes refer to as the additive for the new Soylent Green bars. So if you've seen the movie Soylent Green, you know that what's in it isn't exactly rice husks, but we can pretend for this experiment. Now, I have weighed the amount of material to a tenth of a milligram or four decimal places on a precision scale and I have it now contained in a crucible. The crucible actually sits in, let me grab this, sits in the actual bomb container. Okay, here's our fuel now. I've talked about the lid and its purpose in igniting the fuel. Now in the, at the bottom we have a crucible. The crucible holds the actual fuel that we're going to burn. In this case I have an additive for Soylent Green bars, just like in the movie. And in past experiments, we've done Pop-Tarts, peanuts, actual fuel, even foam rubber. Uh, so pretty much anything can be burned in here, but ultimately we like to try to do something that's consistent, has a good higher heat value, and can be reproduced. Now you'll notice that as I've put the, the fuel in here, the nichrome wire is touching the fuel. This is so that when we put the thing all together, we guarantee combustion. Now, once we have it in there and we're happy with the seating and the, and the wire placement, we can take it and put it inside the bomb itself. So, we're going to place the sample in the bomb. So, we drop it in, careful not to spill anything, and we push down. Take the lid, screw it down until it's tight. Just snug, doesn't have to be 500 foot-pounds. There. Once snug, we're ready to go and put oxygen in it. Okay, now we've got the thing tight, the fuel's inside, we're ready to energize with oxygen. So we're going to put about 20 atmospheres of oxygen into this thing. I've taken it and I've carried it to the back of the room and now I'm going to place the little connector here, allows the oxygen. So remember that this is the valve, make sure that's tight, otherwise we'll be here a long time I'm trying to fill it up if it's not closed. And there's our two electrodes. So I go over to my oxygen supply 
and I gently open it up and you hear a little click and as I slowly go up and stop around 20. Now, if I go over a little bit, it's not a big deal. The, the limiting reactant is the fuel, not the oxygen. So once I'm happy it's full, I release that, come back, take this off, and I'm ready now to put it in the water. Now, once energized, I'm going to place the bomb into the container. Now, from the above, you can see that there's no water in the container, and this is for demonstration purposes. Normally, this would be filled with exactly 2.000 kilograms of water. So when you think about it, the bomb itself has the fuel. The fuel's going to ignite. It's going to heat the bomb, which is then going to heat the water, which then also has to heat this outer container and all of it is insulated by this air pocket in between if we back up we can see and by this thick container and so once we have that if imagine there's water in there i'm going to put the lid on now once i put the lid on you'll notice that there's this little impeller now the impeller is there to actually mix the water around and to hopefully homogenize the temperature so that we don't have warm spots. So I'm going to go ahead and put that down in there. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and we hook up our little much like an old turntable on a record. You may have seen one in a museum once. So, but here we have this. So if we turn this thing on, it's gonna spin around. And the last thing we have to do is it's not spinning now, but is put our temperature probe. So place our thermometer probe in here, down it goes, and it sits in the water. Now, the thermometer probe is actually connected to our temperature sensor. So in a second, I'll go ahead and start everything and then discuss this more. So now I have the system running. As you can notice, the impeller is spinning. This is to homogenize the water temperatures mentioned. I have the temperature probe in and I have the temperature sensor in our temperature box measuring temperature. Now if I focus in, you'll notice that we get three place accuracy on our temperature. Uh, we go up to 20, it, right now it's telling me that it's 20 point about 545, 546 degrees C. Now the timer's important because we're gonna let this thing sit for about five minutes to equilibrate. Once we've reached that point, we're then going to start counting up to another five minutes. And we're gonna take temperature measurements. Now, the reason we need to do this in weight is that be because of the shearing of the impeller, there is some actual work going into the water, which is the subsequently creating heat. That heat will show up on our curve, and we need to factor that out later on. So we're gonna collect data from zero minutes to five minutes, just looking at temperature. Then, once we reach five minutes, we're gonna go ahead and ignite our bomb. Now, if we fast forward to five minutes, imagine we're waiting and it says five minutes, we would come over here to our bomb, and as exciting as all this sounds, it's not the same as launching a Titan rocket. At the time that we need to launch it, we simply push this button. Now, if we push that button, oftentimes there'll be a red flash going on. That red flash will be instantaneous. And what really tells us this, the experiment is successful is that we'll subsequently see the temperature start to rise. Now, as you can imagine, you're heating 2,000 grams of water, plus everything else that's in there. So we're not gonna see temperature jumps of 10, 20, 30 degrees. We're gonna see, we might be lucky if the whole experiment gives us a degree. But fortunately, this whole system is very, very accurate. And so even only getting that small amount, we still can get very, very good results. So, once we're done and we've taken our data, then we just reverse the process that I showed you. We take everything apart, and the last step is to actually measure the residual wire. 
Now, following the experiment, this is the last step. So we've run the bomb, we've measured the data, we've, we've evacuated the residual air or oxygen, and we've taken the thing apart. So all that's left to do at this point is to measure the residual wire. Now, most of the time, not all the wire will melt during the process of ignition. So we want to have a sense of how much we started with and how much is left. That way we can get the net wire that burned and then subtract that energy off. So usually there's a piece on one side and a piece on the other side. Once you remove those two pieces, you're gonna do the best you can and lay them out and use this precision metrology device we have here. And actually, we're gonna use centimeters and millimeters, and we're gonna measure how much is left. Now, our uncertainty in this case is gonna be plus or minus one millimeter. Even though we can measure to a millimeter, so technically our uncertainty should be half a millimeter, we're gonna use one millimeter because the wire is typically not straight. It's kind of difficult to get a good, accurate measurement. And that's it. We have all our data, and now we're ready to do the analysis.